let's continue to stay in this Holy Spirit. Father God, we come before your throne of grace. We humble our lives, Master. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our midst. Break every bondage. Break every sickness. Many of us have come here with hunger, thirsting, prayers for deliverance, things that we have prayed for, for for so long, waiting for your reply. Let the Holy Spirit speak through me, O God, and let it divide and break every bondage of the enemy. We come before your throne of grace. We humble our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk about as I was praying as to what I need to talk, I was led to talk about small sins. So the Holy Spirit kind of re- revealed that we have a choice, and that's a choice that we give ourselves right now. Choice between life and death, or death. Good versus evil, blessing versus curse. And you guys have this choice today through the Holy Spirit. The same choices we see in the Israelites, Moses provided to Israelites so many times. Joshua provided so many times. So as we look through these choices, I want to remind us to read Numbers 2010. If one of you can read that loud. It's not the main verse, but... Just remembering two things before. Numbers 20.10. So, um, then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. This is before when at the waters they were thirsty and God had spoken to Moses to tell the rock, right? To speak to the rock and the water will come out, right? We think because Moses hit the rock when God told him, that was counted against him. But when we clearly see here, it says, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water? So the we here, I was listening to a video um, from Bible Project, and they were talking about this too. God said he would do it. But when Moses said it out of anger, or he was angry at the people, he kind of said it, we. So the we is a big thing where he's sharing God's glory. So that was founded against him. So that was one reason why Moses was never allowed to get to the promised land. So it's a reminder for us, all the people who come here to preach the word of God, who are here to worship God. At any point of time, we need to be very careful who we glorifying. If it's us, then we need to repent. If it's God, then we need to give him glory alone. So that's a reminder. Moses, who saw God, who was with God, who did so many things, was taken away from God's presence because he shared God's glory. We are nobody. Second reminder is about Job. So if you read um, Job 9, 17, 22, and 23, Job was a holy man. God says that. But what was Job's, Job's sin? So it, takes, it says Job sinned against God by accusing God of injustice. But he later repents of it. So chapter 9, 17, 22, and 23, he talks about God being unjust. So that was counted against him. But we think oh, Job was right. He went through suffering, all that, right? And he did not do anything wrong. But... God clearly says, and then God comes and replies to him and gives him the reason. All that, you, don't, you were not here before the world was made. God gives him entire reasons. So sometimes, even when we go through trials and difficulties, we really need to be careful if we think ourselves to be holy. And the same reminder goes to the coming of the Lord. A lot of us think that we are ready. We are The moment Jesus comes, we'll all be lifted up. But God is reminding us today about all the small sins that we have to be really careful. So that's the main goal for today. Now, there are a lot of small sins. I'm just going to cover three today. 
if God willing, if whenever I speak next, I'll continue later. So before we do that, um, Job 8, chapter 5, 6, 7. Bildad talks to Job about how to have God move in your life. So if you're praying about something, if we are all praying about something, we are all waiting for God to answer. We First, we need to know if it's God's will for us. But if we know it's God's will, we have to wait for God's time. But there are things we can do for God to move in our lives. What is that? So eight, Job 8, 5, 6, and 7. So it says, first thing, see God earnestly. We have to see God earnestly. We have to take every other priority away and put God first. Seek him with all our heart. Second thing it says is plead with the Almighty. We have to cry. We have to fast. Many of us have forgotten fasting. It's a reminder for us. It's not where you get your prayers answered because of fasting, but you align your bodies to the will of God. That's what fasting does. It doesn't give you an answer. It doesn't make the impossible possible, but it aligns your body, yourself, to the will of God. So third thing is about if you're pure and upright. It's probably seventh verse. You have to be pure and upright first before God can move into your circumstance. So all the people who are waiting, praying for whatever topic you are, the Holy Spirit is right now telling us that we need to check into our lives and see if everything that we have, everything we do, everything we say, how we react to people, is it pure and upright? So let's, let's get back to our main t- verse. Romans 1, 28 to 32. And it says, Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. So first of all, it talks about these people knew God. So all these verses that are coming is not for outsiders. It's for God's own people, right? For our church, for, our, for us. Second thing. So let's do 29. So it's a big list. Um, and if you could show the slide um, on there, it basically lists all these out. There are 21 items. Um, talks about unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder. We'll go through each of those, right? But today we're going to cover about unrighteousness, evil, and covetousness. So before we even do that, let's talk about Deuteronomy 30, 15, 16, and 19. This is where Moses is telling his people, hey, you have a choice, choice between life and death, choice between curse and blessing, choice between good and evil. So it's the same choice we have right now, right? So many times we Christians or Pentecostals especially, we make mistakes. And sometimes before we take the Holy Communion, we confess. But that's not wrong, right? We have to confess. We have to confess daily. But the Holy Spirit is reminding how many of us have made that into a habit. God wants to break those habits out. Sinning out of habit is really bad. But sinning once or twice, here and there, God forgives. But if it's a habit that we constantly, every week, we come here of the same sins, whatever sin you're struggling with, right? If it's a habit, there's a, there's a, there's a curse behind it, there's an evil spirit behind it, you have to understand if it's your own pride or if it's whatever is causing that sin to keep happening over and over again then you have to find out. So, let's go back to Romans 1, 28 to 32. First, we'll talk about unrighteousness. First example. The slide on the comparison. Um, All right, so, first verse about choice of unrighteousness is verse... Romans 2, 8. Romans 1, 20, 1, 18 and 21. It talks about, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, 
who by their unrighteousness suppressed the truth. For although we know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So it talks about people who knew God, but they chose not to honor him. So what, that's the evil part of it, right? What's the good? Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. So a lot of these comparisons are not straight, simple comparisons, but it talks about how we choose or what we want to choose. So if we choose righteousness, God is going to bless us for the righteousness. If we choose to continue to do evil and are quick to repent and then go back to the same thing over and over again, then we're truly not repenting out of it. Second would be... Jeremiah 22, 13, 17. It says, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness, by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing, who does not give his wages, dishonest gain, oppression, violence. So if we are doing any of that, it's time for us to repent of that. But from the opposite of that, if we look at Matthew 6, 33. It talks about, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So there are so many examples where the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us, if we continue to look deeper into our lives, it will reveal to us the, the reason for the sin, reason why we continue to get away from God, reason why what we need to completely get rid of and come close to God. If we continue looking at the evil side of it. Next example of unrighteousness is Romans 3, 13 to 14 and 17. It talks about their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. A lot of us Pentecostals have anger. Sometimes we confess it to God, but the moment someone hurts us, the moment we think someone is saying anything to us, that anger comes. And then what we say to them is not at all holy. And it can be for people who are in the Pentecostal life for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Still, they haven't let go of that anger. Moses, out of that anger, even though he knew God, that anger cost him to get away from us from God, right? So that's what it talks about. So if it's anger that you're controlling, if it's your tongue that you have to confess about, if it's something that when people, even if you're right, right? Sometimes that's the best part of it. When you know that the other person is wrong and you're right to be angry, anger is not sin. But when you come and say things to them, that's what causes it, right? So even if you're right, you still have to be really careful that your tongue does not sin. You have to be careful that you do not say curses and bitterness. So what's the opposite of that? I mean, not exactly an opposite, but a benefit. So Isaiah 32, 17 says, And the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. So when we follow in God's anointing, when we follow God, then our anger is turned into peace. And then our words, we learn the importance of quietness and we learn the importance of trust. Trusting in God and trusting that God is in control. Next example would be James 3.6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. So, this continues to talk about tongue, but it says it can stain your whole body. So, whatever comes out of your mouth, you have to be really careful because it can set on fire the entire course of life. So, it's not just them or the other people that's affecting. Your own life can be affected. The opposite to it would be, then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. So, we can use our tongue to praise God. 
Um, not much time is left, so I'm going to go fast a little. Um, Romans 6, 12, 13, another example. Let not sin make you obey its passions. Instruments, do not use your members as instruments of unrighteousness. So you have to be really careful that you, you do not use your body that God has given you for unrighteousness. Um, what's the opposite of that? Romans 6.13 says, Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Second, um, going forward, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. It says, Or do you not know the unrighteousness will inherit the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? It talks about sexually immoral, talks about idolaters, talks about adulterers, homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards revilers, swindlers. So if you're one of those swindlers, if you're swindling people, if you're in a business and you're swindling, if that's something that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you to get rid of, please do it, right? What's the opposite of that? 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it talks about, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now moving on, Isaiah 55, 7, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Then God will abundantly pardon. So it's just a reminder for us. The, the good part of it is Proverbs 10, 2, Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but unrighteous, but righteousness delivers from death. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 talks about lawsuits against believers. We continue to... So what it means is don't go... Get your grievances within the church, sort it out by others, but try and talk to them. Try and sort it out yourself. Try and talk to a pastor. Get a loving relationship in church, right? It says, Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Even if you're wrong, it's okay to be persecuted. It's okay to take that punishment. God is with us. Um, second is evil. Do not be overcome evil, overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, right? Um, the good part of it is when we move to do good, when we continue to do good, even when others are bad to us, even when others say bad to us, when we out of love, when we out of grace show love to them, then what happens to us? Then it brings plans for welfare. God will open up plans for welfare. God will give you a future and a hope. God will hear us. When we seek God, God will start talking to us. So many of you, if you're waiting on God to talk to you, there are times when God is saying, even when you are right, it's your duty to show love to someone who does not show love. Go beyond, go that extra mile. That is that what's, that's what God is trying to tell us, right? Another example is Proverbs 11.19. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. Spiritual death. Opposite of that is let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. All right, coming back to third point. I'm, I'll just have one, one and a half minute left. Covetousness. A covetousness. So the meaning of that is a strong wish to have something, especially something that belongs to someone else. So if we are looking at your neighbor, if you're looking at your friend, if you're looking at your cousins, your relatives, and they're doing better than you, if someone in church is doing better than you, right, you have to be really careful how you look at it because then it can cause you to sin. You don't know their story. You don't know their journey, what they went through, their closeness to God. And you're, you may not be at all close. So sometimes it's good not to compare and just trust that God is able to provide for your deals, right? So it says excessive desire for wealth, possessions, control, power, fame, all that is coveting. And coveting is a root sin from which a lot of other sins come up. So a lot of us in Pentecostal life, we, do, we think coveting is not bad or we don't know what coveting is in terms of our own lives. Sometimes we look at, um, worship team, yes, please. 
Um, sometimes we look at other people's cars, other people's houses, other people's jobs, other people's careers, but not realize that the journey that they have taken to get there, or if they are at a good position, they're using that for the kingdom of God. But you expect it to happen fast, but you may misuse that to get into hell. So there is a time and a place and a space and even a pace by which God will bless you. God does not want to bless you and throw you into hell, but God wants to bless you so that you would continue to bring others to God. Right, so coming back to f- topics. Job 20.21 20, says, Because he knew no contentment in his belly, he will not let anything in which he delights escape him. Talks about contentment and food. A lot of us want to just eat. Don't want to exercise. A lot of us just eat because we are stressed. A lot of us eat because we f- we think it's good, but we don't control it, right? Because we don't are not content. The opposite of that is Proverbs 38. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. So. When we start praying godly prayers, anything and everything that happens in our life would truly become the will of God. Right? Um, continuing. Luke 12, 15, it says, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Opposite of that is Luke 12, 20, 30, and 31. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, nor what your body, nor about your body, what you would put on. Your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these and all these things will be added to you. So if we are one of those people who are just praying for possessions, if you're one of those people who are just praying for ungodly things or that is not God's will. Sometimes you have to be really careful of what we pray for, right? There are other examples that I want to not get in because I've overdone my time, but there are so many other sins. There are 21 sins. We just covered three. There's more that talks about gossip, talks about hurting people, talks about so many things. As we learn to sit in God's presence and hear from God, let us humble our hearts today. Let us surrender our lives today. Let us come before God truly knowing what our heart is about, knowing what our sin is about, confessing to God. God, as we come in your presence, O God, as we worship you, help us, O God, to take time to truly look into our hearts and figure out what our motives are, what our thoughts are, what our perceptions are, O God. Help us to confess everything, O God, that takes us away from your kingdom that takes us away from you, Jesus. Help us to hear from you and truly be used by you, O God. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray.